Now, to understand heredity and selection and variation and evolution, you first need to understand at the root level the difference between phenotype and genotype. So what's phenotype? What are the characteristics that you can call phenotype? Basically, all that you can see is the phenotype. In humans, the eye color and hair color are examples of the phenotype. So the phenotype of an organism is an organism's actually observed properties like appearance, development or behavior. And genotype is an organism's full hereditary information. Now, the part of the genotype that is expressed is called the phenotype. Expressed, big word. What does it mean? Nothing much. When the information that is there in your genes gets manifested or shown, it's called gene expression. Now, the phenotype that you see is because of the combination of the genotype that you have and the environmental factors that affect it. We're going to see how exactly in a short while. Now, genotype is nothing but the genetic information that you carry. Now, each trait in you, which you can see has two parts or two alleles, one each from mom, and dad. Now, let's go back to a little bit of basics about the nucleus, the hot spot of the cell where you can file all this blueprinted information that apparently decides what you're going to look like and a lot more features that make you so special. So, if I take a typical cell over here, the nucleus is right here in the middle. Let's zoom in and see what's happening. This darker part over here, this is called the nucleolus. The nucleus takes decisions and makes important laws for the cell based on the information it gets from the chromosomes inside the nucleolus, which you can identify as a darker portion of the nucleus. Now, all the information or the important information is blueprinted in the chromosomes, which are like special strand-like structures made up of protein and DNA. DNA, what's that? Deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, the DNA has important hereditary information. Uh, by hereditary information, I again mean the information that you have inherited from your parents that decides all your features, your genotype. The protein called histones keep the DNA neatly wrapped up and coiled because if it was not for the proteins, the DNA would not fit, you know, in this way. In fact, if you take out the DNA, all the DNA from your body, of one person's body, it would stretch to the sun. Not once, not twice, but an astounding 600 times, okay? So it's that long and it's bound so tightly in your nucleus. And since life starts as a single cell, it keeps on dividing to produce new cells which come together to give you tissues and organs and organ systems and then you. So all the information that is required to form all these tissues, organs and organ systems is found in the DNA. Now, the cells in your body keep on dividing so that this important genetic information is passed on and the portion of the DNA segment that contains all this information is called a gene, G-E-N-E, -E, okay? We look a bit like our parents do because of our DNA. And same is the story with you. A puppy would carry its parents' DNA too and would hence look like them. It's the same story for every single creature that reproduces sexually. What determines each one of us at the gene level is our DNA, our genotype. I hope it's really, really clear now. Coming to chromosomes, all eukaryotes have them and they have them in different numbers. We humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Pair, because there are two of each type. So in total, we have 23 into 2, 46 chromosomes. Because they come in pairs, they are called diploid. Okay. Now, since these pairs of chromosomes are so similar, we call them homologous chromosome pairs. Homologous is a simple word once you break it up. Homo is similar, logo is relation. So same relation or similar relation. There are only one pair of cells that are haploid. They have exactly half that information and they are found in, yes, the sex cells. That is the sperm and the egg. So that when they come together, the resulting cell called the zygote gets one full set of 46 chromosomes. And then this keeps on and on dividing. Now, not long after homologous chromosomes were discovered, someone noticed one exception. 
human males have one pair that is not homologous. The larger of these chromosomes was called X and the smaller was called Y. So we boil down to one big basic genetic difference between human males and females. Females have two X chromosomes. Males have one X and one Y. The other 22 pairs of chromosomes are the same. Not to confuse you or anything, but with birds, it's exactly the opposite. XX is male and XY is female. Some organisms have more than two pairs of each chromosomes and these are called polyploid because poly is many. Uh, some plants are polyploid like potatoes. They're polyploid. Don't worry. Just this fact does not make potatoes better than you. So when there is a single set of unpaired chromosomes, it's called haploid and bees can be said to be very, very, very bees. -er, okay. Males develop from unfertilized eggs. They're all haploid. Well, as all females are diploid. What is the significance of diploid? Remember, I told you that you inherit traits from mom and dad. So it so happens that you get one half of your DNA from mom and one half from dad. Now, all your body cells will have the same mix of DNA. So the 46 chromosomes grouped into 23 pairs are pairs with good reason. One in each pair from mom and one from dad. Those pairs of chromosomes are pretty similar, but they're not identical. They contain versions the same gene called alleles and these alleles are found in the same spots on the chromosomes so uh, if you won't talk about any kind of features like having dimples or the ability to roll your tongue or the fact that your earlobes are free or attached all of these have different alleles this essentially means that if you look into chromosome you would find different parts of the dna of the chromosome responsible for different traits but the beauty is you get one copy from mom and one copy from dad and if mom's earlobes are free and dad's are attached how does your body decide which one you have all of this is related to something called dominance and recessiveness, which just simply means that in nature, there are some traits that are more favorable. And thus, when they interact with the recessive form of the trait, the dominant one is expressed. And as I told you before, expressed is not a big word. Expressed just means visible. Turns out that having dimples is dominant over not having them. Rolling a tongue is dominant over not rolling. And one more very interesting one, having wet ear wax turns out to be dominant over having dry ear wax. Cellular DNA is the information source for making proteins in the cell. A section of the DNA that provides information for one protein is called the gene of that protein. Brings me down to my next big important question. Why exactly are proteins this important? To answer that, let me take an example of tallness. Tallness is a characteristic. Now we know that plants have hormones that can trigger growth. Plant height can depend on the amount of a particular plant hormone. The amount of the plant hormone made again will depend on the efficiency of the process for making it. Obviously, now consider an enzyme that is important for this process. If this enzyme works well, a lot of hormone will be made and the plant will be tall. If the gene for that enzyme has an alteration that makes the enzyme less efficient, the amount of hormone will be lesser and the plant will be short. And that's exactly how we can confidently say that genes control characteristics or traits. So as you must have guessed, there has to be the smart pan scientist or scientist who first realized and discovered that these things exist, how these things work and surprise, surprise, this smart pan scientist was a scientist as well as a monk. He was an Augustinian monk from Austria who in his spare time, hold your breath, bred pea plants who he must have loved so dearly and was totally obsessed with. A little known fact is that Mendel began his studies on heredity using mice. He was at St. Thomas's Abbey, but his bishop did not like one of his friars studying animal sex. So Mendel, you know, sadly switched to plants. Now you must be assuming that uh, he would be quite a gardener, but no, he was not just any amateur gardener, but a scientist who studied his pea plants so carefully so carefully, he called them his children. Oh my God, what kind of dad does experiments on his kids? And why exactly did he choose bees? 
It was pure luck, actually, but they turned out to be perfect models for genetic research with so many stable varieties. There was a tall variety and a short one. One type made smooth, round peas, while others were lumpy and wrinkled. There were green peas, yellow peas, grey seed coats and white seed coats, white flowers and purple flowers, and so on. Since every pea flower has both male and female parts, by default, they would fertilize themselves. So Mendel practiced some family planning on them and set about his task on creating hybrid varieties. First, he snipped off the anthers, that's the male part of the flower that produces pollen, while still immature. Two, he dusted the stigma, that is the female part with pollen, uh, taken from the appropriate or desired father plant. And finally, he tied bags over the flowers to keep out any stray pollen. This way, the monk was playing God and controlling the parentage of each generation. His first big discovery was dominance. Uh, when he crossed a tall pea plant with a short one, one would expect medium-sized plants. But no, they were all tall. So he concluded that tallness is superior superior or dominant over shortness. So the trait of tallness is dominant and the trait of shortness is recessive. In every case, in each and every case, one trait was found to be dominant. Round seeds are dominant over wrinkled ones, plump over pinched, grey seed coats over white seed coats. So it did not matter which parent contributed the pollen and which parent contributed the egg. A tall, short hybrid was always tall. And then came the complication. What if you cross two hybrids? When hybrids were self-fertilized, about one-fourth of their offspring were short. The recessive trait appeared. The other three-fourths were tall. When he further continued the self-fertilization, that is the short with the short and the talls with the talls, he found that about one tall out of three produced only talls, while the others yielded both talls and shorts in a ratio of threes to one. And the shorts, they bred only shorts. What did he interpret? There is something in the pollen and the egg that determines the height of the pea plants. This something is called a gene. Each pollen grain and egg has one height gene. So the plant formed by their union has two. So the gene is of two distinct types or alleles. One allele A for tallness and one A for shortness. So depending on what they inherited, a plant can have same or different alleles. The allele A is dominant over A. So a plant with a combination of AA would still be tall. The alleles do not blend. Now, let's look at a case, okay? When AA breeds with AA, pollen and egg get one copy of each because sex cells half the number of chromosomes, right? Taking you back to what I taught you a few minutes back. They are haploid and all other cells will be diploid. Now, in the case of AA and AA, the sex cells respectively get A and A as I mentioned. So the offspring will be AA or tall. Now, in the case of uh, AA or AA, that is small a's, the sex cells again will get A and A and the varieties yielded will be stable and short. In Mendel's first hybrid experiment, the cross was between AA and AA. So the pollen and the egg carried A and A. So the cross was AA, which was tall. You remember that I told you everything revolves around phenotype and genotype. So in this case, the tallness or shortness is the phenotype and the combination of alleles at the gene level. AA, AA or AA is the genotype. So even though the first hybrid experiment gave us a tall plant at the gene level, it was AA. And this is called heterozygous because hetero is different and uh, zygous for zygote and then homozygous is same. So there's nothing to memorize here. They are all just logical names derived from various languages to just give you that extra twist. Okay, let's continue with our story. When the hybrid self fertilizes, its alleles A and A are sorted out randomly among the pollen, grain and eggs. Both A and A appear and roughly in equal proportions. So what are the four possibilities? Short pollen, short egg, tall pollen, short egg, short pollen, tall egg and tall pollen, 
tall egg these are the only four possibilities that can happen now this is too much to write let's just put it in a square let's just simplify it okay and it's got a fancy name it's called a punnett square okay p u n n e t now let's write down the four alleles and then it's just simple combination you have the egg here you have the pollen here you have capital a here small a, a here a here and a small a here bring them together and what do you get a a a a a a and a a this is every type of offspring possible and so when the hybrids were crossed he got one fourth true breeding tolls half tolls which may breed shorts and one fourth true breeding shorts and mendel did not stop here being the inquisitive scientist that he was he wondered what would happen if i play god between plants differing in two characteristics say a tall plant with smooth seeds and a short plant with wrinkled seeds our height and smoothness correlated somehow do they depend on each other or do they act independently when their plant reproduces what exactly happens that's what he wanted to see let's call the alleles for smooth seeds as s and that for wrinkled seeds as s because smooth is dominant over wrinkled now let's cross them and see what happens you have a a s s and a a s s the pollen and egg will have a s and a s first generation will be a a s s and yes the offspring will be tall and with smooth uh, pea pods as this is what is dominant and when this hybrid was self pollinated let's just put it down in a punnett square and it would look like this now as you can see a constant ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 in each case this experiment proved an important thing that the genes for height sort out independently of each other they do not blend or mix just to brief you again an organism is homozygous with respect to a given gene if its two alleles are the same and heterozygous if they are different enough of pea plants let's talk about you and me clasp your hands together without thinking about it most people place their left thumb on top of their right as this happens to be the dominant phenotype now for fun try clasping your hand so that the opposite thumb is on top feels strange and unnatural doesn't it so dominant is left thumb on top and recessive is right thumb on top looks like we are recessive out here same is the case with dimples the dominant trait is having a dimple so if your mom and a dad both have a dimple you will definitely sport one once you have checked out your smile in the mirror you also know uh, if you were paying attention what a high five modern geneticist means by phenotypically smooth and genotypically heterozygous your first few steps towards the wonderful world of genetics and biotechnology and let's answer that big question we asked you right at the beginning of the chapter about identical twins are they phenotypically the same and what about genotypically when it comes to identical twins since phenotype also depends on the environment if one twin being the aggressive teenager that she is decides to color her hair hang out on the beaches and sport some major suntan and the other one decides to just eat eat and eat they wouldn't be phenotypically the same but genotypically they are the same as they have the same dna note that i'm talking about identical twins or monozygotic twins and what is fascinating is that even though they are genotypically the same because of the movements in the fetus during pregnancy they would have developed distinct grooves on their fingers and because of this they have distinct fingerprints so this says one very important thing about phenotype it is the interaction of the genotype with the environment so genotype plus environment will give you the phenotype and this is very important to understand because something called variation in phenotype or phenotypic variation is the reason this world is so colorful between populations among populations the differences you can see big differences small differences all of this is nothing but variation